This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. As we end the year 2021, I'm sharing some very special episodes with you, as I want to do at the end of each year, and that entails bringing on some very special guests to join me in talking about true crime cases. This year, as I was planning these episodes, I noticed a similarity in the cases I chose. They are all high-profile cases where the perpetrator, or person suspected of being the perpetrator, becomes famous, or infamous if you will. Much has been said, written, and aired about these cases, with the standard narrative applied to each, including what happened, how it happened, and the motivation behind each crime. But you who are regular listeners of Once Upon a Crime know that I try and dig a little deeper to tell the story behind the story of true crime cases. In each of the cases I'll be covering this month, there are details I felt had not been revealed, or at least questions that I still wanted answered. So to help me do that, I've chosen guests who, like me, really wanted to dig into the details and discover the real story of these well-known true crime cases. The first case I'll be covering this month is that of infamous serial killer Edmund Kemper III. Most, I think, might know him as the co-ed killer, but if for some reason you're not familiar with this case, I'll just give you a brief summary. Edmund Emil Kemper III was born on December 18, 1948. Side note, why are so many serial killers Sagittarius? As a Saggy myself, this is very offensive to me. He was born in Burbank, California to Clarnell Stage Kemper and Edmund Emil Kemper Jr. Edmund was the middle child of the family. He had an older sister, Susan, and a younger sister, Alan. His parents divorced when he was about eight years old, and his father remarried and had little contact with his children after that. Clarnell raised the three children in Montana while their father lived in Southern California. At the age of 14, Kemper ran away wanting to live with his father. He was only there a short time before his father took him to the town of North Fork where his parents lived on a ranch. North Fork is a rural town located in between California's Central Valley and Yosemite National Park. His father decided Edmund couldn't live with him and his new family because he made his wife, quote, nervous. Telling Edmund they were going to visit his grandparents over Christmas, he instead left him there. Edmund's grandparents, Maud and Edmund Sr., took charge of the teen. The following summer, on August 27, 1964, 15-year-old Ed Kemper took a shotgun and shot his grandmother in the back of the head, killing her. When his grandfather returned home from an errand, Kemper shot and killed him as well. He then called his mother and told her what he'd done. She called police, and Kemper was arrested and remanded to the California Youth Authority. He would remain incarcerated until the age of 21 when he was released to the custody of his mother, who was now living in California near Santa Cruz. Within three years, he began killing random women he encountered driving around Northern California. Between May 1972 and February 1973, Kemper murdered six girls and women. In April of 1973, he murdered his mother and her friend. He then fled to Colorado but called the Santa Cruz Police Department from that state, confessed, and turned himself in. He was tried and sentenced to life in prison, and he is still incarcerated in a prison medical facility in Vacaville, California. Kemper is often described by his height. He stands 6 foot 9 inches tall, and his intelligence. It's said he has tested in the genius range. He was one of the first serial killers interviewed by Robert Ressler and John Douglas of the FBI for their initial research into these types of killers. This was because of his willingness to talk about his murders, including details of beheading and dismembering his victims, necrophilia, and allegedly also cannibalism of the corpses. He is one of the most infamous serial killers in American history, and many stories, real and imagined, have been told about him over the decades since he committed his crimes. I'll be talking with my first guest to try and separate fact from fiction, and maybe do some myth-busting about this serial killer. So I'll introduce you to my special guest, and we'll get right into the details. First up, I'm so pleased to introduce Emerson Murray, author of a new book titled Murder Capital of the World. Emerson's book, in my opinion, is the definitive research guide, if you will, 
of a series of murders that took place in the early 1970s in the area of Santa Cruz, California. It would be revealed in time that not one, but three serial killers, although the term was not yet in use at that time, would be active in and around that seaside town, which before then was mostly known for attracting surfers and families visiting the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk, not for serial murder. But that would change, and Santa Cruz for a time would be referred to as, like the title of your book, Emerson, the murder capital of the world. Welcome to the show, and I've really been looking forward to this discussion. So, um, so Thank welcome. you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me, Esther. When you know, I first learned about you and your book and the work on it, I had a lot of questions. I've had a lot of questions in my mind, um, specifically about, and we'll, we'll get into you know, some of the others that you write about in the book, but about Ed Kemper, because I think he was probably one of the first ones that I knew of. Besides Ted Bundy, he maybe was the second who I knew of, like in the 80s, was being referred to as a serial killer. And especially since yeah. I'm in California, I'm here in the Bay Area, and this, of course, happened right up the road from, from me in San Jose. So it was something that I knew something about, but not much. So I really did kind of dive in and try to get the information of the story. And at first, it, it's kind of like at the first reading, I guess, if you will, of, of Ed Kemper. It's like, whoa, this is crazy. And you get all these details and stuff like that. But because I am one of these true crime buffs who reads everything and watches everything, and if there's a case I'm really interested in, I see something and I will consume that as well. And over time, I realized I'm hearing the same things over and over and over. And a lot of questions that I still have, I have not heard anybody speak about, or I've not heard anybody answer them. Mm. So that's why I was really interested to meet you and find out about your book. Yeah, it's the same bullet points you hear over and over and over about it, Kemper. All the nuances have been flattened and it's just turned into, um, almost pure mythology and just these, uh, a series of bullet points. This happened, this happened, this happened. You know, his mom was 100% pure evil. It, he's almost turned into a caricature. You know, he's not a real person anymore. I found that a lot, especially when I started digging into the research, of course, with the Mindhunter TV show. Uh, he's sort of, um, I guess popularity is a weird word, but people know who he is now at this time and are interested in, in him and his crimes. So when I started, started, diving in was kind of aware of that but not so much i mean for us you know we always knew about ed kemper and in our family in particular you know herbert mullen was was somebody that we knew more about you know he went to san lorenzo valley high school the same high school i did and he had he killed 13 people trying to stop earthquakes was his idea in his head and and one of the people he killed was one of my dad's friends and so we I uh, just always knew about Herbert Mullen, but right along with that was Ed Kemper. I remember I first heard the name Ed Kemper when I was at my my friend Steve's house, I think in third grade at the dinner table, his family would talk about it. But oh, wow. in, in Santa Cruz County, I think, right, uh, in Santa Cruz County, I think it's just impacted so many people and everybody's got a connection to it. Everybody knows Edmund Kemper around here. So, right. Yeah. So, yeah. So I wanted it to, to, first of all, ask you, well, you kind of answered a little bit of it, of why you were so interested mm -hmm. in this, in this topic um, and why you wrote the book, but, and we mm -hmm. can go into, you give a quick summary about the three that you do talk about in, you know, extensively okay. in the book, but I'm really interested too, just to know, like, when did you think about writing this book? What was mm -hmm. the idea behind it? And yeah. I mean, for God's sakes, how long did it take you to put it together? Right, right, right. Because yeah, I'm, right. I'm telling you guys, um, you have to like see this book. It's it's amazing. It's 500 plus pages. It's got like everything. I mean, it's like, like I said, it's like a, it's like a desk reference manual of everything, mm -hmm. but it's put in order. You know, it's put in, a, in an yeah. order that you can read through it like like a book, but with so much detail and, you know, documents and transcripts and, um, you know, interviews and, and the trials yeah. and all of 300, 300 pictures. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 300 pictures. pictures, yeah. really pictures that some that I've never yeah. seen, you know, probably maybe yeah. a lot of people yeah. haven't ever seen. So, yeah. So tell me a little bit about how you came to put the book together and like, you know, just the process of that. So to be honest, I, in some ways, I, I never felt like I had a choice. I, ha I had done a previous book uh, called Bruiser Brody about a professional wrestler who was murdered down in Puerto Rico. He was sort of an outlaw wrestler. That's what they call him. And um, 
in that book, I had discovered this style of writing or, or editing even where you tell the story through quotes. And I had seen it uh, originally in a book about the filmmaker Ed Wood by Rudolph Gray. And I thought, wow, what an amazing way to tell a story about, especially about a person that's sort of controversial like Ed Wood was and like Bruce Averti was, where you hear these multiple angles. So you'll hear the same story maybe three times, but it's slightly different each time from however this, oh, this was Ed Wood's sister. Well, she's not going to say anything negative, negative about him, or this is his best friend. He's going to know, oh, this is the guy that hated him. So you get a very well-rounded picture of, of a person or an event by, by doing it that way. Some people sort of find it discombobulating, but that was the style that, that I wanted. And um, in terms of the why, well, I, like I said, I, I never felt like I had a choice. It was just these stories that were just around me all the time. I can remember my parents being at parties with their friends talking about these crimes. And like I said, my friend Steve, you know, his family would talk about it at dinner all the time, talk about these horrible, <laughs> these horrible crimes. So it was just always there sort of in the background. And in the early 2000s, the BBC came to Santa Cruz um, and did a series of documentaries for a series they were working on called Born to Kill. And you, I think you can find them probably on YouTube. And they came and, and my sister-in-law at the time, April was, she was working in the sheriff's office. Uh, she's a deputy working in their public relations department. And so she was sort of the liaison. So I got to talk to April and get sort of the background of what they were looking at and everything. So I was very excited. Somebody's doing this project finally that I've been thinking about my whole life. And um, unfortunately, when the series came out, it was three separate episodes, one on Frazier, one on Mullen, one on Kemper. And I'll talk about them in a second. But they didn't really cross over and they didn't talk about the impact on Santa Cruz and they didn't talk about how insane it was that these two of them were killing at the same time. It was just missed. It was just three separate episodes. So I thought, God, what a missed opportunity. And then in 2019, uh, my wife and I went and saw Mickey Aloofy, who was a detective on uh, the Kemper case, went and saw Mickey speak. And Mickey was very sharp, very together, man. He had his stories down. It was great. And uh, he's just such a sharp guy. But as I looked around in the audience, I thought, if I'm going to do a project, especially one that's a first-person you know, getting quotes, I'm going to be in trouble in a few years. Everyone around me is 80 and 90 years old and the memories are fading and some of them are, have passed away and, and will be passing away. You know, obviously we all pass away, but, um, so it was literally the, the next Monday that I was sitting in, in my office at work and I thought, Oh, I got to start writing, you know, I got the formula, you know, I know I want to do quotes. I, I have the impetus now, like I'm in a hurry, I'm in a race against time. And so I just jumped in and, and started gathering quotes and interviews. And with Kemper, of course, you just go on YouTube. And once he starts talking, you can't get him to stop talking. So <laughs> there's a, a bunch of interviews on there with him. And he's very candid about his crimes. Uh, you know, the the term serial killer comes I think from the FBI and John Douglas that the Mindhunter TV show was, was about. And, and Kemper was the first person they went and talked to because they knew that he talked and he talked and he talked about his crimes and what he was doing, how he was feeling but right before his crimes, right after his crimes. So that's sort of the why. The other thing is that there's so many, like you mentioned, oh, there's so many books and projects out there that just hit these same bullet points over and over and over. And, and it was like, oh, we need to dig a little deeper. I know that we can do better. You know, I know that Wikipedia and Google are easy, but we got to start talking to the people that were actually there and, and getting that kind of information. That's sort of the why. If you're racking your brain to figure out the perfect gift for someone, give the gift everyone wants this year, the gift of travel. Away thoughtfully designed suitcases, bags, and other travel accessories that are awesome. They come in the coolest materials, styles, colors, and with amazing features, like the 360-degree spinner wheels to get you through those airports and hotels with ease, compression pads so you can pack more in, and even a hidden and removable laundry bag to keep things tidy. All Away suitcases are designed to last a lifetime, made from materials like polycarbonate, aluminum, and durable nylon. And if any part of your suitcase does break, Away's standout customer service team will arrange to have it fixed or replaced. And there's a 100-day trial on everything Away makes. Take it out on the road with you for 100 days. And if you decide it's not for you, return any non-personalized item for a full refund. No questions asked. 
Explore Away's full range of all things travel and start your 100-day trial today by going to awaytravel.com slash once 20. That's awaytravel.com slash once 20 and give the gift that's on everyone's mind. Sometimes I feel adventurous and want to try new wines, but I don't want to pick the wrong thing that I won't enjoy. That's why I love First Leaf Wine Club. First Leaf takes the guesswork out of choosing new wines by creating a custom wine print for each of their members. It then maps their vast portfolio of wines to each person's unique tastes. And all you have to do to get your personalized recommendation from First Leaf is take their fun five-minute online quiz. They then send you a selection of wines to try based on your palate and preferences. Try them out and then rate them. The more wines you rate, the more each shipment is personalized to your taste. I told First Leaf that I was partial to Pinot Noirs, and they sent me some really interesting reds that I never would have chosen on my own, like a Pinotage from South Africa and a Garnot Garnacha Garnacha from Spain. I don't even know how to pronounce that, but I just know that it's yum. And if I ever don't enjoy a wine from First Leaf, I just let them know, and they will give me a credit toward my next shipment. See? Foolproof. Celebrate your special firsts and the moments that count with First Leaf, the wine club designed to help you discover new wines you'll love, personalized to your taste, and delivered to your door. Join today and you'll get six bottles of wine for $29.95 with free shipping. Go to tryfirstleaf.com slash once. That's tryfirstleaf.com slash once for six bottles of wine for just $29.95 plus free shipping. Here's a toast to firsts. May you enjoy them with the people you love from the first sip to the last. Tryfirstleaf.com slash once. Oh, oh, oh. John Lee Frazier, he was actually a mass murderer, and he killed, um, in Santa Cruz, we had a family named the Oda family, and Dr. Oda was a very prominent eye surgeon. Uh, his wife was very involved in the community. So John Lindley Frazier, was, he fashioned himself as sort of an eco-terrorist. He, I think, without a doubt, had some mental health issues, and he, he murdered uh, four members of the Oda family and Dorothy Codwallader, who was Dr. Oda's uh, secretary. And this happened on the heels of the Manson murders and on the heels of the Zodiac crimes. And so this was a massive, this got press all over the world, gun sales through the roof, this division between sort of straights and hippies just, you know, was put to the test, a stress test. And California and then, came out in a really good light, right? California? <laughs> all this right, is Cal right. Manson <laughs> and Zodiac and all of these like, oh, Lord. It's like, <laughs> what is going on out in California? Has it gone, everyone gone mad? So, and, and shortly on the heels of that, um, Herbert Mullen uh, started murdering people. He was a local boy. He, uh, like I said, went to the same high school I did and, and, and grew up in this, this area. He started experimenting with drugs and he had some tragedy in his life. His best friend was killed in an accident. And so he started killing he, because he believed that by human sacrifice, he could prevent natural disasters, such as an earthquake that would that would break California off into the ocean. So he, he started killing men, women, children. He killed a priest in his own church. As a kid, I used to think of him as Michael Myers in, in the Halloween movies, just, yeah. you know, this just this insane killing machine. And then along with Herbert Mullen and very roughly the same time, Edmund Kemper started uh, murdering coeds. He had murdered his grandparents when he was 15 and went away to Atascadero in the CYA, California Youth Authority. And then he was released to his, the custody of his mother against everyone's better judgment. And he started picking up hitchhikers. He practiced on hundreds of hitchhikers where he would just pick them up and try to get them comfortable, but drop them off with no harm done. And I always think of him as like a, as a hunter, you know, he was perfecting what he had this ultimate game plan for. He had his special glasses that made him look uh, less threatening and his murder clothes that were dark if he got blood on him and his car that he had rigged up where he could drop a chapstick in the door handle and his victim couldn't get out. You know, he just had thought through all, all of that stuff. And even the way he dismembered um, the, bo the victims after they were dead so that um, identification would be very hard. Yeah, so he started uh, murdering. And then ultimately, I think as most of your listeners probably know, he ended up killing his mother and, and her friend. And then he fled to Pueblo, Colorado and, and ultimately turned himself in. And like I said, we're going to be focusing on Kemper just because, you know, brevity of time, because there's so much we could go into. But the fact that all of three of these killers were basically on the loose in this, you know, not a very big area, 
you know, at the time. Mm -hmm. And all at the same time, it's so interesting and I think probably unprecedented that, you know, as far as we know, did you, in re doing this research, did you come up with any theories of why and how this happened? Yeah, and I don't, there's no like a silver bullet kind of theory. In the book, I present several different like, hey, this was going on at that time. And I, I think because each of the killers were so different, I think that um, each sort of had different mitigating factors, but there were a couple of threads in common, you know, and that is, you know, one, the mental health system in California was being defunded by Governor Reagan. Ronald Reagan was our governor at the time, and he, he really defunded the mental health system. All three of them had contact with the mental health system uh, in California. You know, you can, we can talk about the age gap, like the generation gap and the Vietnam War and the protests and sort of. Um, people breaking out into that hippie lifestyle, especially, especially in Santa Cruz and drugs being more street drugs being more readily available. Um, there were all of these sort of factors. Another thing Peter Chang said, he was the district attorney at the time and Peter Chang had a quote and it's not a hundred percent accurate, but he said Santa Cruz was like no other place in that you can be downtown surrounded by people in a downtown area. And within three to five minutes, you can be in the middle of a forest with no one around that, that would hear a thing. And that sort of makes Santa Cruz a, an ideal area for this kind of thing. Additionally, law enforcement, like retired law enforcement folks told me that Santa Cruz was always known as a dumping ground for bodies from crimes that happened all over the Bay Area. And then, of course, Kemper, he said, well, you know, all those beautiful co-eds up at UCSC, UC Santa Cruz at the university. So it's just you know, the set of circumstances, but I don't think there's a silver bullet. I think anyone that tells you, oh, there, there's just one reason why I, I don't think that that's accurate. I, I think the answer is extremely nuanced and, and that's another thing, you know, people try to hammer it down and give you easy answers. There's right. no easy answers or something like this. You're right. It could be a combination of certain things. There was a lot of hitchhiking going on, especially in California. The weather was always good. So people were outside more, you know, walking and hiking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just did not long ago uh, a series about the Trailside Killer. Um, oh, yeah. You know, and that, yeah, was, good, good that was another one that you know, people talk about because, you know, people were outside and people weren't afraid then as as they are now or, or as wary, maybe. Um, as yeah, and I think these crimes had something to do with, with that. Oh, for yeah. sure. For sure. You know, and Santa Cruz, even today, though, I mean, it's still a pretty free town, you know, like you see a lot of people outside. You see people, you know, walking, hiking, running through the forests. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, know? yeah. And uh, it, it it is. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful place, and you could be at the beach. You could be, like you said, in the woods. And yeah, there's a lot of very remote forested areas in between. So it yeah. makes sense. It's kind of like our, our pine barrens, you know, in in New Jersey or something, where you're you're. Oh, I guess every place has their their dumping grounds, right? Everglades, maybe in in, yeah. in Florida or whatever. But this is one of ours. If I could pick out a few things that I think made Kemper seem to be like this real boogeyman that everybody was so, you know, fascinated by, and he became, number one, like you said, is he talked a lot. So they got a lot of information from him, which you don't normally get from these killers. Even when they get caught, they'll still deny, they have nothing to say. Like Bundy, when they do talk about maybe some of the victims, they don't talk about all of them. They won't give up the bodies, you know, things like that. And he was just, I mean, from A to Z, what do you want to know? Like, and, and he really did just yap away all the time. That was one thing. The other thing was his, like you said, his backstory of when he was a kid. So um, do you want to talk a little bit about his upbringing and how it led to that first killing when he was just a teenager? So Kemper, his, his parents split when he was young. I, I, I believe he was like seven or eight years old. Um, and his mother moved him up to Montana with uh, his two sisters. He had an older sister and a younger sister. Even from the outset, he, he had issues. He really worshipped his father. And this is according to his sisters, who I, who I heard interviews with, and, and others, like his friend that he grew up with. He um, really worshipped his father, and his father was not interested in taking him. His father went off and had another family in Southern California, got remarried, had a stepson, and just went on to a different life. Kemper never fully accepted that. He just couldn't accept that his father would do that to him or that that, that had happened. Uh, at the same time, he had uh, an awful resentment towards his mother 
and as i mentioned earlier you know people want to paint her as this horrible person and and maybe she was horrible in some ways but you have to keep in mind that she would wake up at night with with this boy with a hammer standing over her, her eight-year-old son stand, with a hammer standing over her he was also doing other things you always hear the things oh playing electrocution and cutting off the dolls and all that stuff and people sort of separate those stories as if oh Kemper did this ha ha how interesting it's it's going to lead to this thing or whatever and then oh Clarnell put him in the basement so you know the famous story that that there was one of the houses that they lived in uh, had this basement that she had moved him into as a bedroom because she didn't want him sharing a room with his sister and you know it was of the light was across the room and he had to walk through the darkness and the only at the furnace he would watch the fire and all that stuff well you got to remember we get most of these stories from Kemper we don't get them from other people and Kemper is highly manipulative um, by his own accounts and he's going to spin the story to to suit the story that he wants to be told and I have no doubt it was not nice it was not good and that she wasn't a great mother but I just think it, it gets exaggerated and she gets so demonized like like I said before like she's like a caricature she's not even a human being anymore she's just this demon woman but I mean Kemper said that he was sneaking out of the house in the middle of the night with a bayonet to go kill his school teacher his sister school teacher and was hiding in her closet and all this stuff you know what which of those stories are real and which aren't I mean whether they happened or not, he was still talking about having done this as a small child. So, or I wouldn't say small, as a young child. Ultimately, um, he runs away from home. He has a lot of issues, which we can get into uh, later with bullies. There was a neighbor named Lee that accused him of killing his dog. And Kemper was at school. This is before he killed the cats or anything. Lee and his friends were just bullying Kemper. And Kemper's sister talks about them chasing them and going to a movie theater. And Lee's friends were breaking Kemper's glasses. And Kemper never stood up for himself or or any of that he was um, always on the defense and always running away he his sister even joked one time as she got caught by the bullies i think it was a different set of bullies and, and ended up getting thrashed and her brother was nowhere to be seen he took off so that all happened and eventually he wanted to go to his dad's and i think he had gone and visited and, and come home once or twice i can't remember the exact number and eventually he he stole his mother's car and went and ran away to his father's house. So he gets to Southern California and he, he sneaks onto the doorstep and hears his father and he's on the phone with the mother and he's saying uh, all, all this stuff. And he thinks that his dad doesn't want him. So he runs away and he's crying. He calls his mother and his mother calls the dad and his stepbrother comes and picks him up and brings him home. And the dad says, no, you're going to stay here with me now. We're going to live with me and everything's going to be great. Well, it's not, it's not great. Christmas comes around and Kemper's father takes him and says, we're going to your grandparents and uh, his parents' house in North Fork, California, very remote, very rural and moves him out there and then says, oh, by the way, you're staying here and leaves and leaves Kemper there. So Kemper's very unhappy. His grandmother reminds him a lot of his, his mother, even though she's the other side of the family, uh, very overbearing, very strong-willed, all, all that stuff. So the grandfather buys him a 22 rifle and he's shooting at birds and squirrels and all that. And he said he killed everything that came through the property. He said it got so bad, the birds were would fly towards the property and fly around it, which I thought was sort of a funny story. But Eventually, things come to a head and he ends up killing his grandmother. His grandfather was away at the store and he comes home and he did not want his grandfather to see what he had done. He's 15 years old, so he shoots his, his grandfather as well and kills him. So Kemper um, is then sent away to Atascadero Hospital. It's a rough place. You know, it's all adults there. He's only 15. But, you know. But he was already uh, he pretty big about... at that. He was a bigger kid, though. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. He was adult size. Yeah. And he talks a lot about, you know, if the place is full of rapists and he learned there that, you know, if you're going to do some kind of crime like that, you need to kill your victim. You can't let him live. So that's where I think he started to really get sort of those ideas, you know, and I sort of skipped over the killing of the cats. He killed two family cats and all that. Yeah. So then he's in Atascadero for several years until he's 21. And uh, I have the records from Atascadero, you know, I mean, every pill he took, every session he was in, every single day, every log. And it was, 
mostly uneventful. He hurt his knee a couple of times and, you know, they went back and forth with group and he was a typical teenage boy, you know, they at group, he either is quiet or he tries to take over and is real boisterous. So, okay, that, that's typical. But one thing that happened when he was there is his father did come and visit him. And his father, unfortunately told him, look, pretend like I died in the war and I'm not your dad and just forget about me and forget I ever existed. And leaves him with that and leaves. So, I mean, how soul crushing, right? You know, this person that you idolize telling you something like that. So Kemper's mother and his sister, his younger sister visited him every other week. I have records of that, but his older sister had a family. And then eventually, as we started and when he turns 21, he's, he's released to his mother in Santa Cruz. She had moved to Santa Cruz because they were talking about moving him to Montana. Even though the crime was committed in California, his mother was in Montana and they talked about moving to Montana and she, she didn't want that to happen. I guess it's like a hellhole or something there in, in that facility they wanted to move him to. So she came to California and moved into Aptos and I think she was in Capitola first. So, you know, that whole story you just told, I think you highlighted some really good information there because that is the thing that you hear. That is the talking points that you hear about Kemper is that his mother was this horrible person and it's almost like she brought it upon herself what he yeah. did because she, you know, was so horrible to him and abusive and, you know, either psychologically or physically or both. You hear all these stories about that or really vague because you don't really get details because people don't know the details. They just kind of assume yeah. what he's saying, like you said, is the truth without really knowing what that truth is. But here's the th here's the things that I pulled out and and that's the reason why, why I went through through your book um and all the all of these details because these were the questions that I had. My thing, my background is in psychology. I have a degree in correctional psychology. So when people are incarcerated or have done, you know, these things or whatever and see psychologists, psychiatrists, that's the part that I want to pick apart and say, okay, so let's get down to what happened here. You know, like, why did they react the way they did? Why did this happen? What I see, even with, like you say, some things that you see on TV or, or books or things like that about these crimes is they're not interested in that. They're interested in the details of the crime, uh -huh. especially Kempers, because they are so horrendous. They are so uh -huh. gruesome and they are so, you know, just out there that people get really caught up in that. And they don't look at all at what I think is more interesting is why, you know, what happened uh -huh. here? So one of my first questions, you know, again, coming from that psychology background is, and I dealt a lot with family dynamics and, and I worked with juveniles. So with people uh -huh. that were juveniles who ended up incarcerated for, you know, anything from murder to car theft to whatever, I always want to see what's happened in the family. You know, what are those relationships like? Who are these people? How did they parent? How did they, you know, were they neglectful? Were they abusive? Were they um, overprotective? Were they, you know, all of these things. And my first question about Clarnell and his family was, I guess the, the first idea I thought is like, okay, obviously they split up, like you said, when he was like eight years old, he stays with his mother. His father takes off, starts his other life, yep. has nothing to do with him, basically. You know, I mean, they, there was a couple of visits here and there, but there wasn't nothing consistent. Obviously, everybody knew this because that's all he talked about was how great his dad was, that his dad was his yep. hero, his dad was this great whatever. Where he got that information was really all in his own fantasy because it also sounded like even when his dad was there, his dad was not, even his sister said that, he was not involved with the kids. His exactly. sister said yeah, something his about, about, yeah, his sister said something about like, you know, I don't think he never wanted to have kids. Like he wasn't interested. Yeah. He wasn't yeah. there. And so mom was doing all the parenting. Yeah. So you have some things, and this was really interesting to me, that you have some, I, maybe I, was it from a Tascadero? It must have been right after he killed his grandparents because things that Clarnell has said, I don't know if they're written or they were like a, a, yeah. an interview or something. Yeah, that's an interesting document. So it's a document when he was, after he had been arrested and he was in Seaway for a short time while they were figuring out the trial and while they were figuring out what to do with him. When he was admitted into Tascadero, she wrote this document, this handwritten document uh, about her son. And, she, and that's where the quotes from her come from. Yeah, it talks about um, her family history, her, his father's family history. And uh, she talks there about 
having to be a mother and a father at the same time, you know, uh, and she had some biases. Uh, her, her sister had a son that was gay and she blamed the coddling. She said that her sister was coddling the boy all the time and that he turned out gay. So she was adamant that she was not going to do that. She was going to be stern. I think she was stern anyway. She had um, sort of a, a, a mean, a mean sort of sense of humor and was very critical of things and, and questioning of things. And just, um, she was a tough woman, no doubt. Yeah. So that's where that document comes from. That comes from when he was admitted into a Tascadero. And it, it's sort of fascinating to get her Inside, obviously, it's her baby boy, but yeah, and, you know, and that's that's what I got from it. You know, in some areas, she did talk about the because you know she was saying he's being raised with just his mother, not a father, and two sisters, you know, who yeah. took care of him, and that's a lot of nurturing and a lot of mothering and a lot of female energy, I guess. And mm -hmm. so she thought because his dad basically, you know, bugged out, I have to be even more stern because I have to give that male energy so he's exactly. not doesn't become like a little weenie or whatever right yeah. <laughs> and or become gay that's what yeah. she was afraid of like like her nephew yeah yeah, yeah. so th yeah. that was yeah that's so that was interesting that. so she, she did say that um she was very clear about that that was part of the strategy of how she was with mm -hmm. him you know because she thought that would just be you know something that would be terrible because of course the times and whatever and maybe her own biases about you know mm -hmm. homosexuals or whatever that's just how you know she thought but the other thing too is that you see is that she obviously is very close to her son. She knows like everything about him, even his secrets. I mean, up to a point yeah. when he was younger. The other thing I noticed too, is that she really doesn't like the ex husband, the, his father. Yeah, yeah, Cause she yeah. just calls oh, him, the, so biased, she yes. calls yeah, him the father. Yes, she so. never writes his name. Do you notice that? Right, right. right. Cause yeah, at first exactly. I was reading the first couple of paragraphs. I'm like, who's, who is this talking? It's funny. Cause I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought she was talking about because they have the same name, you know, yeah. Edmund Kemper the Third. But as a you know, interested in psychology and studying it, yeah, you may be onto something that, yeah, that she's that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting. that was a, I, she just calls him the father. The father. Yeah. She never says his name. She calls him the father. Oh. And even I think I think the daughters I noticed did it once or twice too said that. Mm -hmm. And I think that it was a couple of reasons why she did that. One is because she really didn't like him, and two because yeah. it was like he's distant from us. He is not, I'm not going to call him his father or his dad. Yeah, he's not of this unit. We are a unit. We're a family and he is right. elsewhere. Not that's involved. What he, yeah. I think, I think chose. you're definitely onto something there mm -hmm. for sure. And like you said, she's very insightful, knows the secrets, doesn't miss a thing. And so it's interesting when Kemper says, since I was eight years old, I would stand over my mother while she's sleeping with a hammer. I remember when my kids were born, I developed this daddy radar where a kid could cough across the hallway and I'd be wide awake. You know, what mother is not awake? Yeah, I mean, unless she's drinking, but is not awake when this eight-year-old standing over her with a hammer. Give me a break. And so, you know, I, I know that she, she knew that those things about him, that he was troubled in a lot of ways, without a doubt. Another thing that, that we I didn't really hit on was that she had gone through a series of husbands after that mm -hmm. because she was pretty tough. Yeah, I didn't she know that. I didn't these, know that. Yeah, she mm -hmm. got these kind of wimpy husbands, and these wimpy series of husbands. And I'm sure that impacted him. You know, he's comparing these guys to this image he has of his father and the, this hero and this wonderful man. And so I know that he, at least he said he didn't respect any of those men, Yeah, uh, that they just let her run all over him. The, the big picture of it is even his sisters say it was it was not an easy time for my mom. You know, she had to work and take care of all three of us and and she was raising them and she said it wasn't easy. You know, we didn't have a lot. She had to work really hard, but she was there. You know, she didn't like abandon yeah. him. She always made sure they had what they needed. And yet he idealized his father and hates his mother. And, you know, that is pretty typical of kids who have been abandoned by one parent is they do that because I've worked with people, you know, parents that this has been, you know, an issue and they're like, man, you know, it's like, I can't do anything right by my kid. They just, they're always arguing with me. I'm this terrible person, you know, whatever. I said, okay, well think about that though, because you're there. They know in, you know, in their being, in their gut, that you are the solid parent that is not going to leave them. So you are the safe one to dump on. Right. 
Because yeah. if he was to say something to his father, like, you son of a bitch, you abandoned me, his father would be gone and he'd never see him again or hear yeah. from him again. And he knows it's not me to do that. More. Exactly. Right, right. Yeah. And that I said, sense. so yeah. it sucks that that is what happens to you, but know that that means that they really in their gut know that you are the stable parent that's not going to leave them, you know? And yeah. so yeah. that's yeah. what I saw with him because, because here's a couple of clues to me too, about what he did. He killed his father's parents. He didn't kill his mother's parents or his mother or his right. sister, even though he said he wanted to. He killed his father's parents, you know? And when I realized that, I thought, okay, why aren't people getting this? You know, the person he really hates is his father. And of course, for yeah. very good reason, he abandoned him multiple times and in very cruel ways, like you said, you know, dumping yeah. him off. The, the whole scene where he steals his mom's car and he goes out to California because the mother had called because she knew that he was, that's where he was going to go. She, she, yeah, she knew where he was going. She yeah. knew where he was going. And so she calls, probably the last person on earth she wanted to talk to, she calls him, yeah. his father, and says, hey, he's on his way there. You know, let me know what's going on. And apparently he was either talking to her or somebody else about it because he knew he was coming. And that's what, what Edmund heard when he got there. His father was basically saying, look, and I think Ed, but other people said it too, that, that his father's wife. So his, his stepmom was not comfortable with him as with him around quote unquote. Yeah. Yeah. Even Kemper, Kemper himself has said that. Yeah. That yeah. he would, he didn't know how to react to her. So he'd end up staring at her and, and she was very pretty, like a model type and, you know, the Southern California and the, the stepbrother was, um, you know, like a bodybuilder type, very good looking. So, but the, he has said as much and, and everybody has said she, she felt really uncomfortable with him. I, I imagine she was just from what I've heard also high strong as, you know, as well. And to have this teenager that's like, Hey, you have my dad and I don't have my dad, right. you know, he's just and he's staring seen, at him like you a know, dog, And there's, you know? there's some things too about his personality that I think don't come up enough is, and, and again, I learned these details from your book and things I hadn't heard before is that he did not socialize at all with other children he did mm. not play with other kids he did not mm. want to he basically stayed home he was very self-conscious about everything from i mean from very young age he didn't feel like he fit in he already had this idea about himself that he was not as good as these other kids yeah he was different yeah, yeah. he he was more awkward he was more whatever but he switches that and makes it about later on, you'll see it becomes this narcissistic tendency where he's better than everyone. So he can't relate to you. Right. You know? Um, right, right, right. But at the time- You have to do that, right? For your survival, your right. own mental survival. You have you have to flip that script somehow. But that's, def that's right. When he was younger, his sisters talked about that, how sort of wimpy he was and and picked on and no friends. And, and even the gentleman I talked to when he moved to North Fork and he was in high school said the first time we met him, we're playing basketball and he picked up my brother really strangely. And my brother said, God, that guy is weird. And, and his response, well, we're all weird around here, you know, North, North Fork. Yeah, it was just sort of known. And then you see the interior rage come out against the cats. It doesn't come out against his bullies. It doesn't come out against other people, he takes it out on the cats, but essentially helpless exactly. creatures, you know? So it has, yeah. to, it has to be something that he doesn't feel threatened by because I mean, right. he was the biggest kid in town and he was afraid of everybody. He was afraid yes. of everybody. I mean, these bullies were not bigger than him, you know? And he, he yeah. was always, I mean, he was 15. How, how tall was he at that point? Oh. He was a bit right. He's in over six feet tall. And the, the other story I was relating earlier where he ran away when his, he and his sister were attacked, it was a, a group of, she said it, not me, of Native American girls in Montana, and they were after them, and he wouldn't stand up, and he ran away. So, you know, the way I think of it, Esther, is that when you look at his booking photo, and you look at the straight on picture of him and, and then there's a profile picture. You look at the straight on and he looks like a handsome, he's got the glasses, you know, so in that time, there's sort of a stereotype of, of being smart and he looks relatively handsome, you know, together. And then you look at that profile picture and he looks like a completely different person. He looks like 
a sort of a victim of somebody that was picked on, you know? And for me, I always think, you know, there's a lot of Kemper fans or people that are really interested. And I just saw somebody made a t-shirt on one of the Facebook boards that I go to. And I always think they're, they're looking at that straight ahead picture, <laughs> but they really need to look at that profile picture. And that's the whole, what we're talk, sort of talking about today is that profile picture. Right. And for me, that photo, that those two photos just sort of say it all about Edmund Kemper, which I always think is funny, you know, even when he was housed in Redwood City, um, after he was arrested, uh, he was housed next to Mullen and he has a whole story about manipulating Herbert Mullen with peanuts and splashing water on him. And Mullen, who I've written back and forth with several times, said, oh, I don't remember that th that story. Whoever told you that is is lying to try to get attention or something. And I thought, oh, that's sort of funny. I mean, Mullen was, of course, out of it. So the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. That is a major accomplishment for him. And, and it's a story that everybody repeats over and over. And it's like, what is you splashed water and gave peanuts to try to manipulate somebody to stop singing like this guy that had these mental health problems right. like what is i mean that's how does that make you kind of a tough guy nothing, <laughs> yeah that's a nothing story and he has talked about his fragile bones and things like that and and i always thought it was funny because mullen was a, was a boxer he's an amateur boxer and he was a short guy but or is a short guy he's still alive but he was a boxer, like he was a fighter. He knew how to fight. I just thought it was, it would be interesting, you know, the perception of either of them in a, in a real context. So, well, that's the you thing, know. you know, it, it seems like even in the Mindhunter series, like he's this big mm -hmm. kind of almost scary, menacing guy, even though he's got this baby face and he comes across as trying to be very charming and stuff. But in that one scene where you see uh, the guy that's the John Douglas type character talking to him, at some point he gets to, you can tell that his face switches and he's like, shit, I'm alone with this guy. This guy's a monster. He can kill yeah. me, you know, that kind of thing. And yet, like you said, when you really see him in context of his real life and the things that he did and the things he didn't do, you realize that he's scared of everything. You know, he was mm -hmm. afraid of everything. And this was, you know, one of the reasons why he was so careful when he was planning his crimes, because he did not want to get yeah. caught because he thought, I'm going to get killed. Like the, the police are going to just kill yeah. me, you know? And that was, yeah. that was the thing. So he was always hiding everything. Um, of course, you're going to want to hide that if you want to continue doing it as well, you know, the, the serial killer mentality. But yeah, but he was afraid of the bullies in school. He was afraid of his mother. He was afraid of confronting his father. He was afraid of just about everything. And even though, you know, despite the size, because he was what, six foot nine at, as a, at adulthood? Yeah, six nine. Six Six nine, yeah. you know, big dude, and he used to hang out with cops, but they kind of thought he was. A, some thought he was a nice guy, some thought he was a weirdo. You know, like there was kind of happy, yeah, yeah, or just yeah. annoying. That was the other thing I was gonna say. He was so annoying, so annoying. <laughs> you know, That's funny. and it's like well, everything I read about him. It's like again, reading through the lines and reading his. I'm sorry, but there was times in the when he's going off on his whole confession thing that I'm like, okay, Ed, okay, let's go, let's go, let's move through this. You know, because. Mm -hmm. That was, like you said, his his big claim to fame. And now he's this, this scary monster dude that did this stuff. But even the cops that were listening to it were like, just would he just shut up already? You know, like, yeah, not yeah. because it was so gross. The, the trip home. But it was. When they brought him back from Pueblo. There was exactly. four people from law enforcement, that, uh, or three people from law enforcement, and that brought him home. And, yeah, they were like, we needed him to keep talking, but at the same time, oh my gosh, please shut up. <laughs> and, you know. It's it was just, hours of just him droning on oh, about, and he yeah. did, and he was, you know, he definitely had details about things, but of course, you know, from his own perspective. And one of the reasons why that stood out to me about him just being annoying. And then, so when I picked that up in your book was when the cops would say, man, he just, he was annoying. He used to talk and talk and talk about it. He'd walk in and start talking about himself, you know, and mm -hmm. he'd just go drone on and on and on and about his problems and about this and about that. And and sometimes it was like, all right, we got to go, you know, like it was that kind of thing. And the reason why I was looking for that kind of thing is because of the story. Again, it's one of these things that you hear over and over and over in every account when he's talking about when he killed his mother, because he says that was that night. It was late and I came home or she came home or whatever. And I went to her room or the doorway of her room and she said, oh, I guess you're going to want to talk all night now. Now that to me rang completely 100% true. 
that she would say that right. to him. And I thought, because you're so freaking annoying. Like she was probably like, oh God, I'm tired. I'm half drunk. Leave me alone. I just came from a party and you're going to come in here and drone on about some bullshit that I know is bullshit. And it's like, can we just go to sleep? You know, but the other thing that I picked up from that statement that he made about his mother is that she would listen to him. She would be there. Mm -hmm. She, you know, and Marley, sometimes she told him to shut the hell up. But, you know, who who wouldn't? You know, it's like right, right, right. you got this gigantic <laughs> guy living in your tiny duplex. That's the other thing. That's a tiny duplex they lived in. It was right, not right, a right, big yeah. place. People think, oh, he had this yeah. huge backyard where he buried bodies and heads. No, it's a, that's that was my question is, how did he do all this in this little tiny place? Because I know how small those places are, right? There's not much yeah, art I mean to them or anything. So, yeah, so she's no, living I mean, with I this think huge guy. You know, the sort of willful negligence, I think people just didn't pay attention. I mean, he talks about dismembering bodies in the trunk of his car, looking up. It's a crowded neighborhood, too. I'm mm -hmm. not sure exactly how many houses were there back then, but if you go there now, it's not a, a big street, neighborhood. right? Yeah, no, not at all. And it's like a U, so it's really compacted with houses. Or So he talks about, yeah, you know, cutting up bodies in his trunk and looking up and pe seeing people in their windows. And there they are looking out and just a different sort of era, you know, where people just were, were not vigilant in that kind of way. It was more yeah. like mind your own business. You, you always hear about the, um, what was the one in New York? Kitty. Uh, oh, Kitty Genevieve. Know, yeah. Kitty Genevieve. Yeah. Right. yeah. Kitty Genovese. Yeah. As you always hear about that story. I remember that growing up. And I think that that was just a, sort of the a different attitude. That's yeah. just the attitude. Or if you, if you, in a lot of ways, if you go with my theory, it's like, they're like, oh God, Kemper's outside. I ain't going out there. That guy just never shuts up. <laughs> You're going to get so much hate mail. That's great. <laughs> no, bring it, man. That's because awesome. I'm telling you, this guy is, he's <laughs> if I go out there, he's not going to stop talking. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's exactly. So, I mean, <laughs> they probably avoided him like the plague. So, you know, <laughs> and, and he was just an annoying dude. And even in those interviews, even when you watch those YouTube, you can only watch so much of them, not because of the details so much. The details are disgusting, you know, and of course that could totally turn mm -hmm. you off. But to me, it's something he just, I mean, he talks about what he was wearing and this color socks. And I mean, just minutia that nobody cares about you know what i mean like that's fine and yeah. it's like dude just get to the you know get to the bullet points here let's just move this along and so so that was one of the things i totally picked up about him is that he was annoying his mother put up with a lot of shit <laughs> she that's lived funny. with this guy you know and like you said so this is the thing that i also learned from your book is that he went to, you know, California Youth Authority at first when he killed his, his grandparents because he was a minor and that's where they put them. But then they said, okay, this guy has some special needs. So he went to Atascadero, which is the, the psychiatric kind of, you know, prison facility, right? Yeah. And yeah. so that's where he was, you know, kind of uh, treated. And then they're the ones, that, you know, the psychiatrist there said, don't put him with his mother. Like, that's a bad it's it's like yeah. you know oil and water. It's just like you know putting uh, fanning the fire of this guy's problems. Yeah. But then it looks like what they do. It, and this happens a lot of times with you know in the prison system is they transfer him back to CYA before his release, yep. and then CYA exactly. basically said nothing. Like okay, your well, mother needs to come get you. They said worse than that. They said we're going to remand you to the custody of your mother. Yeah, because you she's have your to mom. Live with your mother. Right. Yeah. And who else do you have? That's all you have. Because your dad's not going to come. Yeah. Oh, he's dead. Which I, found, I thought was sort of weird because the kid, he's 21 at this point, you know, and like Harold Cartwright, who was the investigator for the public defender's office and, you know, it was very intimate. It, it, and he pointed out they, they didn't have a choice. He turned 21. He's out of the system. He is going home. And so, but I thought it was interesting that they would say, you have to live with your mother. I mean, he's, he's older. So. Yeah, that, that's that's a question but, I had yeah. too. And this goes to the next kind of talking point that I feel like we need to like refute a little bit in some ways mm -hmm. is the fact that you always hear about how he was this genius, how he had mm -hmm. this super high IQ and he was this genius and this and that. And yet one thing we know about his, his well, I know now from your book, that he did not do well in school. He w And not because he couldn't, because he seemed like he was intelligent, but mm -hmm. he would never make an effort he didn't like to put effort into anything like he. Yeah, he, yeah, that's true. To me, it was like, OK, if he was so smart and, you know, and the thing is, too, the IQ, I don't think, was tested until he was at a Tascadero. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's the first time I found it. And, and they tested him several times. 
and I think the numbers, the first one was 131. And, and I actually, I think it's in the index, but I reproduced, you know, that, that finding is in the book right there. That's, I, I didn't draw that. So uh, it was 131 at one point, And I think it went up to 140 something before he got out when he was a little older. So but I mean, you hear you well hear read. things like I, I I read things from like 165 to you know yeah. and I'm like where do they get this like yeah I, I think I and honestly it feels like it goes up 10 points every 10 years so <laughs> like so I, I actually heard somebody say it was 180 something oh my I'm gosh like, whoa that it just keeps going up doesn't it <laughs> and I think he was very he was smart very smart I think the law enforcement sort of you know gave that to him uh, with his uh, recollection is very specific recollection of what people were wearing what his victims are wearing what was going on you know he just has an amazingly sharp memory is, does that equate to iq i don't know i i you know in yeah, some way maybe but that's the um, thing though about serial yeah. killers i mean especially you know this about Canberra for sure and for like the serials is they fantasize about what they're going to do for a long time before they start putting it into action, right? Like you said, he did all of the yeah. trial, picking up the hitchhikers and all this. And the whole time he's thinking about what he's going to do and how he would do it and how he would get away with it and all this stuff. Yeah. And so that goes to that whole eidetic memory thing, because it's like you are fantasizing about this so long that when it actually happens, it's like you're seeing it in cinematic color. Like this is like everything wow. I ever yeah. wanted and I'm gonna, and even if they're not exactly correct, in his mind, that's what happened because this is his fantasy. And so yeah. that is, you know, of course that's not his game. And he's gonna wanna, that was the thing I think for the serials, the hardest thing is not being able to talk about it because some of them- I would were, imagine for somebody like that, especially. Yeah, right, yeah. for him who's so, yeah. you know, very, very verbal. Is, is, and the other ones of course wanna keep it as, this is mine. I own, now I own my victims. Mm. And so I'm not sharing that information with anybody or others like him, because he's got this tendency, he wants to be this big person. He wants to be this, you know, respected person that people are afraid of or revere or whatever, that he is going to like really get into detail and tell you, and this is how he did it. And the other thing I, I got in his uh, interviews is he always thinks he's the smartest guy in the room. Always. He's smarter than yeah, the that, attorneys. Sure. He's smarter sure. than the psychiatrist. He's smarter than the judge, you know, and he's always talking about how like, oh, nobody ever knew. No, the judge had never come across somebody like me before, you know, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, but not for the reasons yeah. you maybe think. <laughs> like, right, 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 right. <laughs> the other thing is, is he tells a very good story. He, he is a master at, at, at telling a good story. Another thing I liked about or the why I chose, you know, telling it as quotes is you could you could track that, especially with Kemper, where when he's first arrested, he tells a story a certain way. And then later on, once he gets his, you know, his appointed a public defender and he puts in that as insanity plea, oh, suddenly the crimes are much, much worse. And then later when he's up for parole in 2017, oh well, I was never a cannibal. I never ate human flesh or whatever he said you know so the story changes over time depending on his circumstances who he's talking to what he has to gain what he has to lose all of that and he's so good at telling stories that each one is very believable if you took one of those and said oh yeah that's the hard facts and that's another reason why I couldn't write the book straight and say, I'm Emerson Murray and here's what happened. You, nobody knows. He's alone at night with these victims or these people that are already dead, these corpses, and doing what he's doing, nobody in the world knows. So all we have, I mean, there's some, you know, CSI that can show some things, but all we have is his stories. And so as those stories change, for me, it's extremely interesting to see how they change, why they change, who's he's around, like I said before. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I, that was, a genius, what part, maybe, but, yeah. but, but a, a great storyteller for sure. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I mean, he was very well thought out and planned. That's for sure. You know, um, but like, again, I said, like I said, it was because that was something he'd been fantasizing about for years, you know, so he said mm -hmm. since he was mm -hmm. a kid yeah. and, and yeah. you know, and the thing it was funny in your book, when I was reading the part where he first talks, or at least in the book, it first brings up what he's talking about, the, the cannibalism part of it. I looked at it today and I, I had written in the margin, this sounds like bullshit. <laughs> like, 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> like for some reason, I don't right, buy I it. I don't buy it. Like yeah. some yeah. of it I did, but then the, when he goes into the whole scenario of doing all this stuff, I thought, no, now he's thought it through, rehearsed it, made it this great story. Like you said, you know, turned it into the yeah. story. That's really like, wow, that's going to give an impact when I tell the story this way. And in the genius thing, it's like, he was working at gas stations, you know, his mother worked yeah, at yeah. UC Santa Cruz. He probably went to, could have went to school for free. He didn't take college classes or he didn't, you know, get a degree. He, you know, he talks about how great he did at a Tascadero, but he did nothing really beyond that. You know, I think he had some kind of training for something. I can't remember what it was, um, but he was working in very entry level jobs. Again, I think that all goes, he might've been a very smart person, but he had no self-esteem. He was always measuring himself yeah. against everybody else. And rather than putting any effort, like we saw that from early, his mother says he didn't want to do Boy Scouts because it was too much to do, you know, work to do school, forget it. You know, it's like he didn't want to try. Um, he didn't want to put any effort into it. And she she had a good quote about that. I wish I would have wrote it down. But she's basically said he wanted all of the accolades, basically, without any of the effort, you know, and that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. That sounds about right. You know, and you Mm -hmm. see that through his life. And the only thing that he put his time and energy into was, you know, becoming this killer. That was it. Yeah. And nothing else in his life worked out. But why? Because he was spending so much time fantasizing about doing this and not actually doing something of value to, you know, for the world or for himself or, or putting any effort. So, you know, when people say, oh, he was so smart and he was this and that. And it's like, no, he was a freaking loser. You don't you understand? Like he could have (laughs) been, because even the thing was a judge, it was like, you know, you could have been something, you could have done really well. You're an intelligent guy and this and that. And it's like, yeah, you became, you decided to take, he said something about the two paths. I forget exactly how he put it, but he said, you took the, you know, you took the dark road or something like that, which is kind of the same thing that judge said to Bundy when he, you know, to Bundy. Yeah. 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 Which is interesting to me, but because that was of course later on, I mean, he's not, there's this much about this tiny piece about him. That's interesting. And the rest of it is so mediocre. You know, his whole oh, life funny. is yeah, totally yeah, yeah. if you think about it. I, I totally appreciate your perspective because I don't like to, uh, 100% agree with you, but I <laughs> love it that it's just it's just different, you know, because everybody sort of toes the line when it comes to, to Kemper. And it's just refreshing to hear. Yeah. You know, I guess because, like, you know, I've, I researched so many cases and I just see certain patterns in these kind of individuals that do these these crimes. And if you really look beneath the surface, there's not a whole lot to them. You know, there's not, mm-hmm. and, and not that there couldn't be, it's just that they decided that, yeah, they're not, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm living, I'm living this, I'm doing this because this is the only thing I really care about or, you know, for whatever reason, but it's just, yeah, it's really kind of sickening that they become these like, I don't know, celebrities or something like that. Um, of course yeah, we're talking yeah. about them. So of course, it's not like I'm not contributing to <laughs> I'll, I'll own that. Yeah. I, own yeah. I mean, that's a true crime <laughs> podcast. I mean, it's funny because when I've done other radio interviews and stuff, I don't, we don't talk about the killer i'm i stress how much the book is about the victims and right and uh getting in touch with them and the impact on santa cruz but this you know it's a different but i think you can if you talk about if you really talk about them honestly stop looking at the celebrity kind of aspect of it which a lot of people want to sensationalize because you know people i don't know they they buy it. it it's packaged very nicely on you know these these half an hour shows on television or something but it's not the truth right The holidays are great, but they can be hectic and stressful at times. When I need a break from all the holiday hoopla, you know what my go-to is? Best Fiends. Best Fiends is a match three puzzle game that always entertains and provides me with a fun pick-me-up. What I love most about Best Fiends is that the puzzles are updated all the time with new characters, themes, and challenges. And I can play whenever I want in the offline mode, so I can even entertain myself while I'm standing in those holiday lines. Best Fiends has literally thousands of levels so you'll never be bored. Challenge your friends. Hey, they're probably already playing since Best Fiends has over 100 million downloads to date. Everyone loves Best Fiends, and you will too. To get started, download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. The other thing I did not know, I don't think I ever knew, was the fact that he was actually, had a girlfriend, was engaged. During some of yeah, this, yeah, he had a fiance, which just totally doesn't fit in a lot of ways. 
but when you start to break it apart, it it does in a lot of ways. You know, she was like a sophomore in high school. Oh gosh. And yeah, and he would go visit her family, and uh, he would have to sleep in uh, her little brother's room. <laughs> So she's sleeping with like the six year old little brother in a tiny bed, 15 year old. I could just see him. Fiance. Yeah, it was next door. Well, and her parents ha- couldn't stand him. Oh, they yeah. thought he was, I think they said uncouth or something. Yeah, like that. I actually put that and, because I and, said, see, this this is somebody who knew him. And it goes to my theory. Uh, it was the father, Richard, was it Verbrugge? Is that how you say it? D- uh, Dick Verbrugge was an investigator. Okay. Yeah. Oh, the, okay. And he had, interv- he had interviewed the father. Yeah. yeah. He said, when asked what he felt about Kemper in general, Kemper's fiance's stepfather stated that Kemper showed a gross lack of training in every respect, making reference to his table manners, politeness, and lack of consideration for other people. I mean, he's dating this woman while he's killing, while he's on his I did not know that. Yeah, and it's a Valentine's Day and he spends the night and he uh, is joking around with the son so much and he's so loud and obnoxious that they kicked him out of the house (laughs) and he spent the night in his car. (laughs) his car and where he said that in the morning he he drove his fiance to school because she's still going to high school oh god how yeah, old was he at, the, at that this that time was like he one was... of the last times that they saw was like, he what 22 or 23 at the time how old was he then yeah he's like yeah exactly he's like 22 oh, gosh. maybe 23 yeah i think closer to 22 but yeah and they said you know the relationship wasn't affectionate they didn't kiss a lot they never consummated anything and i don't want to say that it was a cover or anything like that because i think he did have feelings for her but i think he also had sort of uh you know maybe a desire to be normal or something like i'm going to give this a shot or try this or something yeah because it's it hard, seemed like it does, yeah it doesn't like quite a regular... fit in with everything else no it just seemed like a regular dating relationship when we heard stories about you never heard about that at all it wasn't only until more recently i think that people sort of realized that i don't know if he said something or if it, somebody had discovered it somehow and the other thing uh, too is he did not live with his mother the whole time he actually had his own place in alameda right i mean he had his had yeah yeah and that, that's like his first few killings uh, he was living over there the first few murders because you know you always hear about how he went to his mother's house after he got out of you know tescadero and he was living with her, but he actually ended up getting a job, like there was a highway department or something like that. Uh-huh. And he had an apartment up in the um, Alameda, Oakland. like a Yeah, area. yeah, by Oakland. It's right by Oakland. Right. So, you know, so he was living up there, had his own place in that. And then he got in that, uh, was it motorcycle accident or something? Well, yeah, he was on, I think he was in the motorcycle accident uh, oh, first. Is that how he afforded? No, that's how he bought his car. Yeah, and then he had to move home. You're right. I'm getting the I'm getting the time. Yeah, I was, I was, yeah and then he I had, had to move ones. home after that. Yeah. Right. So he, okay, so he gets hurt. He hurts his arm. Um, or something. can't work. Can't work, and so he goes home to mom. But he had money to buy a car. You know what I mean? Yeah, he, that's that was his insurance settlement was to buy a car. Yeah. So what? What did he go home? Uh, to mom? I mean, maybe she had to help him because you know he had been in an accident or whatever but i mean how long did he have to be there he didn't have to be there that long. i don't think you know right, what i mean right, right, he right. wasn't completely disabled you know in so the, yeah. that's also telling like you, this is the person you supposedly hate can't stand to be around or whatever but you keep why because she's the person that was there actually there for you you know yeah that goes to what you were saying earlier she's the one that stuck by you yeah we all sort of have that, right? We all sort of put on a different face and, and you can be normal around your, yeah. your family and the people closest to you. And unfortunately, you know, if you're not uh, doing well or mentally altogether or you're drinking like they were, yeah. he and his, his mother drank a tremendous amount Yes, that you end up treating them so poorly. And it's just such a loaded relationship between the two of them. The sisters talk about that, you know, how tough their mom was to, to deal with and and all that for yeah. sure. No, she and, definitely had a temper. She definitely, like you said, had a um, you know, she had a mouth on her <laughs> that she would she would yeah. say these things to him and they and I guess I I'm, I'm bringing that up only because again, what you hear 99% of the time uh, was how terrible Clarnell was. But yet you don't, you know, two prong there. One is that you don't hear about what she did. Like you said, she went every other week to go see him when he was all these kinds of things. So she was there. Um, like you said, not a perfect mother by by a long shot, but definitely was there for him. And also, you never hear really that the dad did a lot of damage to him, you know, and mm-hmm. was yeah. probably a big part of his problems of why he had so much hate in him and why he did the things he did. But think about this. He always targeted 
the females who he hated. He says how he right. hated women. And this is why he chose them as victims. Again, going to the most vulnerable victims, you know, because he had really no self-esteem and, and didn't really feel competent in any way, even though he was like this big, supposedly super scary, smart guy, but he would, he would target the females and, uh, and he had a certain type that he was looking for as well. They were smaller, they were slightly belt, built, all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah. So you really got to look at that and say, you know, there was multiple reasons. Again, like we were talking earlier, there's multiple reasons that kind of feed into what he did. And it, you can't just point a finger at his mother as this terrible person that created this monster is, is all I'm saying. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I remember hearing a couple of the interviews where he says, when we were, were drinking, we would fight. You know? So it wasn't yeah. just her. Like they were both, like you said, drinking a lot. And I don't think that could, that could. And it would escalate. He said, you know, it'd they, they, be the stupidest little thing about whether he should go to the dentist or something like that was the example that he gave. But uh, it's just these small things that would just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and, and, you know, explode. And even the neighbors commented, oh, they used to fight a lot. Even the fiance, when I wrote her a letter and, and she responded, she said, oh, yeah, they used to fight a lot. So, I mean, it's just. Yeah, it was it was a bad it was a bad dynamic and they shouldn't have been. That's kind of like one of the final things that I, I got from the book, too, is is reading his words. I mean, he obviously is very self-aware of some of his own motivations, some of his own hangups and things of why he was doing what he was doing, his own anger. But when it got to that question or that part of the story that he's telling, he was going to always make it because this person did this is why I did this. Even with the victims. Oh, funny. Even with the yeah. victims. Like he would say, she said this thing. And that really set me off, even though he had just finished saying that he had planned it and he had picked this person out and this tonight was going to be, you know, I was going to find this person and, and do this thing. And if they yeah. got in the car this way and all of this stuff, but then he has to, in his mind, find a reason, one thing that they did, or he just takes it. Well, you know, my mom made me mad that night. So that's why I went out. And then this, you know, this victim said this thing or looked this way. And he always perceives that everybody's looking down on him, that everybody thinks they're mm, better than him. Yeah. And so he yeah. brings that up multiple times, like, oh, you know, these college, and that was the thing, the college girls, they were going to college yeah. and they thought they were all this. It was the first, uh, the first girl that you, and I didn't know a lot about her background, but apparently she had uh, come from a wealthier family and had, uh, I forget what, what it is that she was involved with, but it was something you had to have money. Or skiing, yeah. Oh, skiing, skiing, oh, skiing and, yeah. And she would travel around the world and had pen pals in different countries. Yeah. And, and not that he would pen know pen that pen picking up a hitchhiker, but, you know, he may have got her to talk. He knew she, it after the fact, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then he brings that in as, oh, see, because, you know, and, and that was the thing, the whole overall motivation is, and this, I think, he, like you said, came out later, you know, after he was he was arrested and everything, is where he talks about, that he was striking back at the people in society who would be most like missed kind of, or it would be yeah. felt, their impact would be felt because they would have contributed to the world, basically. You know, they had an education and they were talented and they were this and they were that. And this is what I'm like, how would he know that picking up these, they're hitchhikers. He didn't know this. Yeah. And also, um, it just doesn't sound like anything else you know about him. He wasn't that kind of aggro, angry killer. He killed him in the nicest, quickest possible way. If you're going to kill someone, maybe. I mean, that sounds disturbing for me to say that, but <laughs> everything he did was it was after they had died. You know, yeah. anything horrible he had done is after they had died for the most part. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm thinking of Aiko Kuwa. That was yeah. a horrible, horrible death. But for the most part, you know, he shot him. And it's just that line, that motivation, I just... I just never really bought it. It just, no, he didn't come across as that aggressive or angry or he just didn't. I mean, ultimately, I th I think that, you know, the prosecution had it right and he was a sex killer. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. nobody wants to hear that, that it's that simple. You know, he's learned ab about rape and Atascadero and he just knows that he has to kill him but so that they don't turn him in and and that was very common at that time and I talked to Chris Cottle who was the assistant district attorney under Peter Chang and later became district attorney and then uh and then he became a judge uh Chris said that he had tried so many rapes of women hitchhiking and during that time period and when it started when it really started picking up and happening uh that 
he could not get a jury to take it seriously. The attitude was, oh, she's out hitchhiking. Oh, she asked for it, that kind of thing. And it took years before they were starting to get juries in that had some kind of freaking rational thought about the whole thing. Like, no, what are you, why are you victim blaming or victim shaming? Like, give right. me a break. And, and it just took years and years. And it seemed like that came out way later too, when he's, he's coming up with this theory about why, you know, he picked these people. And I said, no, he picked them because they were female and they were, you know, seemed like easy prey. And this is, was his fantasy because he even says that in, in a couple of his interviews where he says that, uh, he never had a normal sexual relationship with anybody. It was, you know, he never really he said he had never had, yeah, he never had, uh, I won't get into the nitty gritty of it but yeah he never had normal sexual relations with anybody that was alive that was alive exactly that's what he said because that wasn't his fantasy and i think that that came about very early on i don't know if that was when he was young like we said there could be something that he saw or learned about or heard about and you know that just became a fixation of mine it might have yeah. been when he was locked up the first time when he was still young and he heard about these rape stories i'm sure that fed that you know that whole idea of that yeah. of, of that and then later on, i think there was a part wasn't he talking to mullen a lot or something oh yeah that, that was a quote from herbert mullen because i i asked him if they ever you know ran into each other other than that in redwood city and and mullen was housed in vacaville for a time mm -hmm. and and they did talk a few times and i can't remember the exact quote either but mullen says yeah i was interested in science and he was interested in true crime and once that was established we didn't have much to talk about yeah you know what you know what i pictured yeah. mullen's still interested in science i got to tell you he's always asking me to send articles about the the wolves that have traveled across states and things like that <laughs> But he's just really interested in that stuff. You know what that reminded me when wow. when he said, "Yeah, all they want to do is talk about this, you know, crime and stuff." You know that uh, that movie Sling Blade with the oh, with yeah, Bob. Yeah, Remember yeah, at the yeah. beginning where there's that sicko guy because he's in that you know that psychiatric uh, prison facility, right? Because he had killed yeah. his mom or some guy or whatever, and that guy's sitting there just talking about like his really disgusting, you know, yeah. molesting kids and yeah. killing people or whatever, yeah. and, and he's just. <laughs> and he's just trying to keep away from this guy because he's so, you know, annoying and disgusting and he doesn't want to hear it, even though yeah. he's a murderer, he doesn't want to hear that, you know, and that's what I yeah, pictured yeah, yeah. in my mind. As Kimber old man trying to scurry away and Kimber's <laughs> walking after him talking about true crime. Yeah. <laughs> and I kept picturing him as that guy, that creepy guy in that scene. I was like, that's oh funny. my God, that's crazy. But yeah, so I just want to bring back around to just, you know, just to say that there's a lot more in the book, you guys. It's not just, you know, Kemper, of course, you've got the two other, you know, and these were major, you know, major crimes. Again, what's really unique about the book, um, again, it's called Murder Capital of the World. It tells all three stories, but also in context of the time and the place. And you really get a, a sense of that because it's not like, here's a Mullen chapter, here's a Kemper chapter, here's a Frazier chapter. It's kind of like there is that when you're talking about what's going on with those cases at the time, but it's also there's they're in the same place where they got arrested or they're in Vacaville together and this is happening. Yeah. Or maybe Kemper said something about, well, then I think he said something about they used to have conversations, of course, because it was happening at the time with his, you know, his mother, his sisters, or whatever, be talking about these crimes yeah, or even yeah. the girls that were missing that, of course, Kemper was. Yeah. So that was super creepy, you know, to, to read the words that his sister said, this is, I asked him, did you hear about this and that, what he would say about it, you know, to them. Yeah, yeah. She even asked him, that wasn't you, was it? Yeah, the Cindy Shaw. She confronted him the one time. That blew, yeah. blew my mind. Yeah, because she, she, they said she suspected that something about the Cindy Shaw one. She goes, she turned to her husband as a friend. She goes, do you don't think that was Ed? Like, I mean, who would yeah, think that way? On the coast, yeah. Right, yeah, driving by past Devil's Slide down the coast. Yeah. And I can just imagine them, you know, the ocean and they're coming into Santa Cruz mm -hmm. at night and she's just racking her brain at sister because she was thinking back to those cats that he had killed. Yeah. And, and the things and that he used to say and Cynthia Scholl and the things yeah, he used to yeah, do when he was a kid and just, yeah, I mean, I mean, who they would... went to the the mom's house and, and he was living there at the time and the husband went and talked to the to Clarnell and and, she, and Kemper was in bed watching his little TV and she was standing in the doorway and just asked him, you know, was that you? And and he said, how he said something like, how could you even say that? Because mom asked me the same question. <laughs> and it's, it's like his family, it's just, they just had this like, oh, maybe like they, it had crossed their mind without yeah. a doubt. Well, so. I mean, it's not like he hasn't, hadn't murdered before. So 
Well, that's the thing too. Yeah. It's, you know, he had done it before, so it has to cross your mind. I mean, the killings were very different, but it just has to cross your mind. And it's UCSC students and the moms working up there. And yeah, it's so close. I mean, yeah, Yeah, you know, I tried to find other times, like, were they ever in the same place or anything? And the closest I got was his sister worked at the drug abuse prevention center uh in santa cruz and it it was sort of a very well-known sort of drug rehabilitation place and it went through all sorts of drama itself but she worked there and she in the interview the tape that i have she actually remembers herbert mullen staying there because he did and and I, i i found those documents and you know he was like snoring and not paying attention to group and i think the notes say like mullen failed group or something something kind of extreme <laughs> and he did not stay very long but she remembered him and i thought wow that's that's sort of amazing that was one of the few big surprises for me where things linked up Thanks so much. The discussion was just as fun as I thought it was going to be. I mean, there was so much I learned from the book. And I still have to go back through the Mullen and the Frazier stories because, again, I don't know as much about those. I know a little bit. Like I said, you guys, you are not going to get a better reference if you are all interested in any of these or serial killers in general because there's so much in there that really is going to make you you think about just the whole idea of this, you know, who these killers are and what they're about and how— you know, even investigations, you know, come about and the backgrounds of these people and stuff. There's so much in there. One of the last thing I was going to say is that most of the things that we do know about Kemper come most of it from John Douglas and the FBI. You know, it, it's yeah. that narrative. And so this gives you so much more than that. You know, as much as they got, information as they got, and of course that was very instrumental in, you know, creating this whole, you know, the way that they identify and catch serial killers. But there's so much more to it. God, just the pictures and the documents and stuff in here alone. It's like, that will just keep, keep you going for a while. But uh, yeah, really, really well done. So, um, and I appreciate you letting uh, my audience know about that because I know they're going to be really interested in it. So how can they find the book? How can they get it? Oh yeah. So murdercapitaloftheworld.com. You can order it directly from me. My kids help me package them up and we'll get it out to you <laughs> within a day or two. And if you're in the Santa Cruz area, you can also get it from Bookshop Santa Cruz or Two Birds Books and uh, the Postal Annex in Scotts Valley. I don't, you have like an international audience. I'm used to doing local radio, sorry. <laughs> I'll tell you, the Postal Annex is right down the street. No. Um, so yeah, uh, but murdercapitaloftheworld.com. And then there's a Kindle book. I learned how to make Kindles. Uh, uh, Kindle, I don't know if I'm saying that right. I'm like an <laughs> old man. Uh, I learned how to make Kindles. The Kindles. Um, uh, I learned how to do the Kindle formatting, or I don't know how you say it. And so there is a Kindle available on Amazon. But I sort of, I, I created that because the international shipping prices are so outrageous, especially for a f- huge book like this. It's like so heavy. But it's only got like 25 pictures in it versus, you know, 300 plus in the paperback. So... I strongly encourage people to get it. I, I printed a thousand of them. They're all signed and numbered and I'm down to about 300 left. Oh, wow. I'm going to pull, you know, 50 to a hundred because I go and do some speaking events and I, I need books for that. And I don't know if I'll do a second printing or what, but, but we'll figure it out. Yeah. And so uh, you guys, yeah, Murder Capital of the World. Thank you so much. Yeah. Murdercapitaloftheworld.com. Uh, check it out. Yeah, get it soon because it's going to be out and he's going to have to do a reprinting and who knows how long that's going to take, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Esther. Thank you yeah. so much for having appreciate me. I really it. appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that discussion. I want to thank my guest, Emerson Murray, once again for being on the show. To find out more about him and his phenomenal book, The Murder Capital of the World, go to murdercapitaloftheworld.com. We're giving away two copies to listeners. All you have to do to get in on the drawing is sign up to receive texts from Once Upon a Crime. Opt in by texting OUAC to 408-676-1770. That's the letters OUAC to 408-676-1770. Text messaging is provided by textsanity.com. We'll randomly draw two listeners to receive a copy of Murder Capital of the World on December 23rd. So make sure to opt in by December 22nd. This offer is only good for U.S. listeners. Thanks. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Final audio edit for this episode was by Lorena Garcia. Until next time, 
Be good to one another.